Gracious and loving God, uh, thank you for this morning and for the time uh, that we have here to worship you. Lord, we ask that you would soften our hearts to your words this morning, that you would open our ears, unblind our eyes. Lord, as we know that we come here this morning with things going on in our lives that could keep us from you, break through those things, make yourself known. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I don't know if I've uh, shared this in here or not. I probably have. Uh, but one of, the, uh, one of the things that I love doing that even uh, some of my closest friends don't know about is I love to uh, collect uh, riddles. Um, uh, I'm, and I'm not talking about you know, uh, three-minute mysteries where a bell rings, a man dies, and a bell rings, and there's like a thousand different possibilities for what happened. I'm talking about, I'm talking about uh, the types of riddles that you would find where there's really only one possible answer. And before I start to tell some of those riddles, um, I want to tell about uh, how I just kind of fell in love with, with them. When I was uh, younger, I started, um, I started reading, and I started reading a lot, and one of the uh, authors that my dad read often was Stephen King, and so those were books that were around. And, and Stephen, Queen, Stephen King quickly became one of my favorite authors, and he, he writes this series called the Dark Tower series, and it starts out with a, with a book called The Gunslinger, and uh, three books deep is a book called The Wasteland, and in The Wasteland, uh, the main character, Roland, is on a train called Blaine the Train, and in order to get to where Roland needs to go and to get off the train, uh, Roland needs to uh, win, win a uh, riddling match with Blaine the Train. And so it was at that point that I thought, oh, wow, these are, these are actually really cool. And I started to collect them. And, and I started to collect dozens and dozens of them. And as I read more, I, uh, I read, started reading uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. And I noticed in The Hobbit that there were, uh, that there were riddles there. And that uh, Bilbo has a riddling match with Gollum. And, and just thought it was just a really cool thing. And so some of the riddles uh, that I've grown up with and that I've uh, memorized of, of the dozens. I'm just going to share a few with you. And feel free, I know that this is a Presbyterian worship service, but if you have the answer, shout it out. <laughs> the more you take out of it, the more it grows. What is it? A hole. A hole. Yes. Were you in the first service? <laughs> okay. <laughs> what, uh, what flies forever and rests never? Time. Time. Yeah, time. It's good. Uh, or uh, a man rides into a town on Tuesday at 8 p.m. The same man rides out of the same town on the same Tuesday at 8 a.m. How could that be? Yeah. Nice. Okay, good job. Good job. All right. Uh, see, the reason why I love uh, riddles like these is because the answer is often found inside of the words of the riddle. And more than that, the answer is found in reframing our assumptions of what those words mean. For example, uh, Tuesday uh, would throw you off if you assume that Tuesday was the day of the week instead of the name of the horse. Or um, you expected the thing that flew forever to be a material object like a bird, but instead it was an abstract concept of time. It's reframing our assumptions about things that we hear. That's important to me because it reminds me that I often hear things differently than they are intended to be heard. I often see things differently than they are intended to appear. And I often understand things differently than they are intended to be understood. I bring my values, my attitudes, my beliefs, and my practices into conversations and situations. And I assume that my values, beliefs, attitudes, and practices are the right ones. Just ask my wife. <laughs> She'll tell you that I'm not wrong about that, and that I am often not wrong about anything, at least in my own mind. <laughs> and I know that I'm not the only one who's guilty of being uh, arrogant like that. I know that I'm not the only one also to speak about this throughout history. The biblical, uh, biblically, uh, the prophets warned the people of God time after time after time about having the type of arrogance that assumed that we are right all of the time in our beliefs. One of the most often quoted biblical phrases dealing with this comes from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. This is what it says. Go and say to this people, keep listening but do not comprehend. <laughs> 
Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of this people dull and stop their ears and shut their eyes so that they may not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and comprehend with their minds and turn and be healed. Jesus quotes Isaiah later in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 4 when he's talking to, uh, when he's talking to his disciples. In chapter 4, he says, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything comes in parables, in order that they may indeed look but not perceive, and may indeed listen but not understand, that they may not turn again and be forgiven. Stephen, as he was, before, he, before we got to the passage that we got to this morning, and I don't know if you've ever read through the seventh chapter of the book of Acts, but it's an amazing story where this guy named Stephen gets up and he defends himself against the counsel of those who have thrown false accu- ac- accusations against him. And Stephen refers to this in his defense after a long story that he tells about the history of the people of God. And he gets up and he says, in chapter 7, verse 51, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. Uncircumcised in hearts and ears. In other words, you, you think you hear, but you do not hear. You think you understand, but you do not understand. Luke, the author of Acts, in response to what Stephen says, you, stick, you stiff-necked people, emphasizes that the ears of Stephen's accusers were closed. The Pharisees says they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against Stephen and they stoned him. I don't know if you know the story of Stephen or not, but I want to talk a little bit about who he was and where he came from. Because Stephen, as you may or may not know, um, was, uh, was the first Christian martyr, which basically means that, uh, that um, after the crucifixion of Christ, Stephen is the first person we know to have been killed for his faith in Jesus. And, uh, and Stephen, um, and, and so he's famous for that. He's famous for being the first Christian martyr. But what's more interesting to me is who he was before he actually uh, became a hero of the faith. Because Stephen, before he became a martyr, was just kind of an ordinary, everyday guy. He was a guy who was just in the midst of the crowd. He was, he was a person who got elected to become a, a, a servant inside of the, inside of the, the, the congregation and eventually grew in his faith and, uh, and started to show others and tell others about what he believed, and for that reason, he was killed. But before we get into, before we get into that, imagine if you can, uh, for me, for a moment, uh, the size of the crowd that was walking through the streets of Jerusalem at the time that Stephen, uh, at the time that Stephen was a part of that crowd. And imagine how, disrupting, how disruptive it could have, it, it, it was at that time. In the book of Acts, time after time, it says that the disciples, the number of disciples was increasing daily. And sometimes on those days, even by the thousands. Now this crowd was walking through the streets. Imagine uh, us getting up out of our chairs, walking out into our neighborhood and and, and starting to have church inside of one of those streets. What do you think would happen if we just started to Uh, to talk about who Jesus was outside of those streets, right out there in our neighborhood. People would come to their windows and they would look out. Some people would open their doors and they would wonder what we were doing. Today, most people would probably go back inside. Some, though, would come outside and they would join the crowd. Some would listen and they would become more a part of what was going on. After about an hour of having that church service, we would give a closing prayer, and we would give a benediction, and we would send you on your way. But in Jerusalem, at that time, the apostles, Peter and John, and the other apostles who were teaching, did not give a closing prayer. And they did not send people on their way. They just continued day after day, for days and maybe even weeks, of just teaching in the streets of Jerusalem. And thousands of people were following. 
And so what was happening inside of Jerusalem, which we know is what? The Jewish capital of the world, where the best leaders and teachers of the Jewish faith actually resided and made their living, people were coming, were leaving the Jewish faith and coming to a different understanding. And so this was disrupting the society. More than that, as people followed the crowds, everyday needs were not being taken care of. People who were in need were not being cared for. The hungry were not being fed. The naked were not being clothed. Widows, it says, were not being tended to. And so those outside the church, it says Greek Hellenists, began to speak to the apostles about this. And so the apostles saying, well, we're busy teaching. We don't have time to do this. What can we do? And so they said, you, congregation, elect among yourselves seven people of good standing to take care of these needs, to help reach out and tend, for the, and, and tend to the poor and clothe the naked and feed the hungry and care for the widows. Stephen was one of those men. And the Greek word that was used uh, during that time for those men was diakonos, uh, by the way. And diakonos, if you, can, uh, if you can draw the parallel, is the word that we use today for deacon. And it just simply means servant. It was the first biblical uh, institution of the office of deacon. But here's basically uh, the main point of all of this, and here's basically what you need to know. There was a massive disruption in, in Jerusalem because thousands of people were following the apostles as they taught and becoming Christians in the process. And due to the disruption, leaders in Jerusalem were becoming angry and the needs of the people were not, were not being met. So some men were appointed, some people were appointed to take care of those needs. And one of those men was Stephen. Stephen ended up being an amazing deacon. He ended up being the greatest of all deacons. Some of the, and, and because he started to rise up in his faith, there were Jewish leaders who wanted to test him. And as they tested him, they realized that they couldn't defeat him. And because they couldn't defeat him, they became even angrier with him, and they started to make false accusations against him. And as they made accusations, they dragged him in front of a council, and the council said, the council sitting over him in judgment said, what do you have to say for yourself? So what Stephen did is one of the most amazing things. He just started telling the council, the Jewish leaders, the stories that they already knew. He started speaking their language, telling them about how God had worked in the past to see if they could actually see the way in which God was currently moving in their midst. So in the stories that Stephen chooses to, do, to tell in his defense where it becomes extremely important for us to pay attention to the words that he uses. Because the stories Stephen chooses to tell are not by accident. And if you don't know these stories, it's okay. Because the point is that Stephen chooses to tell stories just simply about this. About people of God who were on the move. Stephen starts by telling the story of Abram. And if you remember the story of Abram, God basically initiates with Abram and he says, go, Abram, from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land that I will show you. Go on the move to a place that I will lead you to. It's undisclosed. And from there, Stephen moves uh, from that story down to the story of Joseph, where Joseph's brothers sold Joseph into slavery, and where Joseph is taken to Egypt as a slave. And then he moves on to, but there was a famine in the land where Joseph's father Jacob resided and where, jo and where Joseph's brothers were still there. And so Jacob and Joseph's brothers moved into Egypt where Joseph cared for them. Eventually, though, the people of God uh, became enslaved in Egypt. They became, uh, they, they became confined to that land. There were rulers who enslaved them and who taxed them. And so God raised up this person, this murderer named Moses to lead the people of God out of Egypt and into the desert for 40 years. Now you'll notice that some of these stories are stories where the people of God, where the Israelites, were probably wondering, uh, where is God in our midst? We're in the desert. We're in exile in Egypt. We're being sold into slavery. There's famine in the land. The people of God were, cry were probably crying out, where are you? My life is being disrupted. You seem silent at this time, but looking back, it's easy to see that God was moving in their midst most powerfully 
during that time. At the time, however, those are the times when it seems most silent. It's the space between where people are and where God is moving them to. So then he goes and he says, after 40 years in the desert, they were moved into the promised land. And a guy named David and a guy named Solomon became kings. And then listen to what he says. He says, and David and Solomon, they wanted to build me a house. They wanted to build a house for God. But this is what God said in response to that. He says, yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made of human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Did not, make, did not my hand make all of these things? In other words, I am not contained in houses. I am a God on the move, and I have always been a God on the move. I work when my people are in motion. And Stephen was showing that the people, that God was on the move once again inside of Israel. He wasn't moving the people from one location to the next. He was moving the people from one understanding to the next. He wanted them to see the things that they thought they knew were not correct. The leaders, the Jewish leaders and teachers of the faith were wrong and they were pursuing the wrong things. And so his very next words in verse 51 are, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in your hearts and in your ears. You don't understand what God is doing. And so they killed him for it. But not before God moved Stephen. Question that I have for you this morning is just simply this. Where is God on the move in your life? What is God doing with you? Where is he taking you from where you are to where he wants you to be? I would challenge you to look at the places where it seems like God is most silent, where it seems like God is furthest from you. What is God doing in your life where he seems like he has forsaken you? The people of God, the Israelites, felt forsaken in the desert. They felt forsaken in exile. They felt forsaken in slavery. They felt forsaken when they were alone. But it's there that Stephen points out that's when God was most active in their midst. Inside of Jerusalem, as Stephen was pointing this out, people of God were being moved by him once again. They were being moved from being a people with a promised Messiah to being a people with a Messiah. People who understood the faith, or at least thought they did, to being told that they missed it, and that they didn't see where God was at work. Life is not just about riddles, but riddles help us understand and reframe understanding. I have a, a, about, how to, about what our assumptions are telling us. And one final riddle for you before I close. Often talked of, never seen, ever coming, never been, daily looked for, never here, still approaching, coming near, thousands for its visit wait, but alas, for their fate, though they expect me to appear, they will never find me here. What am I? God is at work in your lives. He is moving you from one place to the next. He is calling you out of your seats and into service so that you can glorify him, so that you can tell others about who he is. Often talked of, never seen, ever coming, never been, daily looked for, never here, still approaching, coming near, thousands for its visit wait, but alas for their fate. Though they expect me to appear, they will never find me here. I am tomorrow, and if I wait for tomorrow to come, 
will never find it. If I wait for tomorrow to figure out how God is moving in my life and to respond to it, I will never get there. God is calling you out of your seats today. He's moving in your life right now. Life is not about a riddle, about finding that answer. It's not about assuming that we're right. Life is about redemption and figuring out where God is moving in our lives and responding to it and accepting the change that he wants to bring in the midst of it. The space between where we are now and where God wants us to be is just simply in the response to understanding that God is at work. Eric, will you pray for us, please?